It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Welcome into the Take Command podcast. I'm Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. And if this looks very different because you're watching us on YouTube, it's it's because if I move this this laptop around a little bit, you see both cameras moving because I'm <laughs> actually sitting across from Logan in his home in Ashburn, yeah. not too far from the facility because we just watched the final training camp practice of 2023. Yeah, it is weird being in person. I think it's the first time on the show we've been in person podcast. I was thinking about that. We've been doing this podcast for over a year. We've yeah. never actually, and we've done shows together in yeah. person, but we've but never actually podcasted. sat together in a room and podcasted together. It feels different. Take a man. It, it does. Yeah. Um, your, your steely blue eyes are making me uncomfortable. Imagine how your fresh haircut is making me feel. <laughs> look at this. Look at this guy all cleaned up. Um, so here's what we got on the show today. End of the show, uh, you'll hear my interview with John Dotson, sure. uh, which I caught or who I caught up with after practice. Uh, but we're going to talk about kind of the end of the preseason, obviously, as we get ready for the game, yeah. uh, Cincinnati, your, uh, your preseason finale on the sidelines. Yes. And then, uh, and then we're going to talk about roster construction. So I, uh, kind of a fundamental question I've been wrestling with the last couple of days is like, what is preseason actually worth? Because we've been talking about the value of getting reps. And it's kind of like this wishy-washy. We're like, yeah, we definitely understand why they wanted to play Sam Howell and why they wanted to get, you know, why teams in general want to get players reps. But you also understand there's a risk. But like, what's the upside if you're ones facing other teams too? It's like, there's yeah. all these factors. So like, if I ask you broadly, what is preseason actually worth? How do you answer that? Well, what I would say is it probably depends, like any good answer. It depends on the staff, depends on their goals. You know, like there was a couple of years ago where, you know, the LA Rams, they didn't play their starters at all in the preseason, not even for one second. And, you know, they end up winning the Super Bowl. And so, like, there was value for them. They got an older roster. They don't want guys to get hurt. Here, I think the value, if you, if you really wanted to kind of get in, like, kind of where I think EB sees the value of preseason or the staff sees the value of preseason, it's really just like more evaluation tools. Like, you know, one of the things about training, like we talk about training semi-regularly on this podcast is like the idea of specificity, right? Mm -hmm. And each one of these stages of the off season gets you something more specific to football, right? So OTAs kind of like football, you run around, but the contact's not there a little bit different, right? And then obviously training camp, you put the pads on, you put the helmets on, all those different things. And then the only time like now, especially with the new CBA, you get to go like something close to live is in preseason games. So if I'm EB and I want to know where the team is at, I want to know where the roster's at, I say like, that's where the value is. It's like, it is the closest thing we can get to NFL football legally in the off season at this point. So to me, that's where I think the value is. And then kind of obviously from a from a coach's standpoint that's where the value is but from an evaluation standpoint there's also more value there too because as as we're at practice today like coaches stand behind the huddle they're like right there in close proximity to the players they're coming back they're always giving feedback all that kind of stuff but on, in the game it's it's you you know so i want to see how a player is going to react i want to see what their mindset is so i'd say one it helps with evaluation two it's the closest thing to live bullets you're going to get at any level of football even the joint practices like you're not going to go live in that situation because it's going to lead to a fight so this is the this is this is it, and I think that's where the value lies. Yeah, I, I guess like following up on that, then what is the most important data point, right? Let's say someone's like solid in practice, but they crush the preseason games, or the other way around, someone crushes practice, they get out there in the game, and it's not as sharp. I think it's really easy to then go back and be like, well, like we have way more data points in practice, sure. you know, and, and you know you start to value those. You convince yourself like, oh, we know we can do it in the game. But if a guy never does it in the game, that would seem to be an issue. And we know there are guys that that are like that, that are sure. great practice players or poor practice players. Right. They go out there and they ball in the actual game. So considering how many more reps you get in practice over the course of a summer and the very limited reps that a guy gets, and you know, on some level, this is. Well, at some level, it's like you're talking about end of roster, like who makes it, but also, you know, starting spots, like any any place that someone's trying to move up or down the roster, sure. or trying to move up, prevent themselves from moving down. Like, how do you try to then weight the actual evaluation of training camp versus what you saw on OTAs versus these preseason games? Well, like with anything, it's it's an aggregate of all the information, right? Like, so if a guy's a, is a bad practice player, but he's really good in meetings, and he's dialed in, he's a professional, he's understanding, he's on time, but never quite clicks it in practice, but hits in the preseason, I'm going to probably be more likely to be like, okay, then what we saw in the game is what you're going to get here from this guy kind of thing. Um, you know, same thing, vice versa. Like if the guy's 
really good in practice, but just totally is not available in the game, like mentally, like just can't handle the pressure, can't handle being by himself, whatever it is. Then I got to, that, that's, that's all data that I got to weigh. Like I played with a guy in 2013 who was excellent in practice. And I thought he's for sure going to make the team. He goes out in the preseason, has a couple of false starts, goes the wrong way in a couple of runs. And the coach is like, we can't trust him in that, in that kind of context. And it was only, I want to say it was like, he played about 25 snaps and they were like, we've seen enough. And it was enough to kind of sway their evaluation the other way. So it, it's, it's an aggregate of all the information, obviously, but I do think that those preseason elements are super important because it, it just kind of gives you the final touch, you know? And so like, if I'm, if I look at this team in this off season, I say, man, like this preseason has gone really, really well in terms of evaluation. Like the offensive lines got better. The protections holding up the, the quarterback looks to be in a good spot and you say, Oh, well it's against the twos, but that's the closest thing you're going to get to live bullets. Right. I don't care if it's the twos or the threes, like they're tackling you, they're blitzing, they're going to hit the quarterback. Right. So um, I think all those kind of data points um, support uh, you know, like support your evaluation. And that's why I think it's, it's not just one thing. It's the meeting room. It's the weight room. It's everything you're doing to kind of say, who's going to be the last five guys on this roster. So that's the evaluation side, but I think there's also, I mean, if we're being honest, the more important is the preparation side, sure. because like by nature, half or more of the guys that you're evaluating aren't going to actually make the team. Right. And even those guys are going to play very limited roles, very limited number of snaps. So there's also the preparation side, which kind of gets to the how question yeah. of, because you know, like there was a really good, there's a really good comment on YouTube on, I think it was on our pod, but it was, mm. it was one of the how adjacent videos that sure. I had posted on my page. And it was basically like every, every second how was out there is really important 100%. because the better he can get, like the, the closer you realize to figure out what he is right. as you evaluate him in 2023 lets you know as soon as possible that whether or not you're in the quarterback market in 2024 100%. and with the new ownership and you know, you know, whatever, like that, that is a real question that is looming over the season is like, is Sam the guy? And the faster, you know, that the better. So getting Sam out there and being like, Hey man, these reps are going to help you get better 1% quicker because you get them 1% sooner. Like that's hugely valuable to us. Crazy valuable. And so it does get to a kind of a question of like, okay, well, how valuable is preseason from a preparation standpoint? Yeah. And if we agree that it's really valuable, then why isn't he playing this weekend? Um, I, I, I do agree that it's very valuable. I, I think, um, you know, at least again, like it's so hard to be in the minds of the coaches, right? Cause like if they, if you operated by the rule of everything they said, you'd be like, Sam should play every minute of every preseason game. But there's also a certain level of risk and there's also a certain level of evaluation and development with other elements of your roster. Right. So like, for example, like they've said, they want Jacoby to get some reps with the ones. Here's a really good time for that to happen, right? No one's going to balk at that because no one wants Sam to get hurt. Sam's established himself as the guy. And now Jacoby can go out and get those reps with the ones in a situation that's very, very similar to a game. And I, and I have no doubt in my mind that Jacoby will do well with this, right? But it is, it's just another piece of like, getting Jacoby prepped. So like, you know, it's so funny. Like I coach high school football, right? And high school football is like the, the, it's like the NFL turned up to maximum. And what I mean by that is you get an hour a day to make sure your offense is ready to go. And so the most valuable thing in that situation is making sure the first quarterback gets all the reps, right? But I need to prep also the backup guy too, right? So it's like you're, you're dealing with like this really finite amount of time and these really finite amount of reps. You need to make sure both guys are ready to go or everybody on your roster is ready to go. Like, you know, I had a conversation with the online coach at the high school yesterday. He's like, well, I want the starters to see all the reps. And I'm like, well, I want the backup guards to get some reps too. And the backup tackle, because they might be playing here, maybe not this week, but the following week. And I need to know, they know what the heck is going on. So I think that's what you're seeing here. Like while those reps are very, very valuable for Sam, they're also valuable for Jacoby. And they're also valuable for his relationship with Jahan and, and, you know, Diami and whoever else is going to be playing with him. Like that I think is so important for fans to understand. Yes, there's tremendous value in these reps, but there's a finite number. So how do you allocate those, those reps to make sure that you're getting the most growth from all aspects of your roster? Right. And this, this is where I think people like we, we struggle. Here's some societal commentary for you. Um, <laughs> like it's, it's where we struggle as a society is like when something is not absolute and there's nuance and it's a gray area and there yeah. are multiple answers to a question. Like 
you're going to have differing opinions on it. And I don't know what the correct, like I really struggle with this um, taken out yep. from society down to uh, your <laughs> to boy you. over here. Um, like I really struggle with this on, on exactly what the best plan is. Like, I think I would probably want to play Sam for a little bit this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get the Jacoby thing. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason we bring that up is like Brissett, the last two days in practice has been practicing with the ones. Yeah. Um, and Ron was asked about it on what's today. Today's Thursday. Yesterday was Wednesday. He was asked about it on Wednesday. And he's like, yeah, we'll give Jacoby some reps with the ones, you know, we want him to get those reps because he's the one that's going to be out there this weekend starting the game. And everyone's like, Oh, okay. We thought it'd be Jake from the whole time, but yeah. okay, sure. And then all of a sudden we go out to practice and it's like, Whoa, he's, wait, it, are the rest of those dudes going to play? <laughs> like, is Jahan going to play? Is the one line going to play? Yeah. Um, you know, especially after you lost Terry, like playing Jahan seems very silly right. to me, but I don't know. He's also a second year player. So mm -hmm. getting him some extra, like if it's valuable for Sam, it's valuable for Jahan. Right. But it, it's like, you know, evaluating that value is, is such a unique prospect to each yeah. individual guy because how dependent are you on other players? And that's, you know, kind of the, the howl argument yeah. is like, Okay, or the Brissett argument yeah, for yeah. that matter is like, okay, well, the reason we want to get this guy, like Jacoby knows what he's doing, but yeah. like, does he feel comfortable with this specific set of skill players? Okay, yeah. let's get him out there. Right. Um, for a quarterback, they're very reliant on the guys around them. Offensive line, how do you gel as a unit? Yeah. For a wide receiver, like, yeah, you want to get rhythm with the quarterback, but you're out there running your routes, you turn around, and the ball's hopefully going to be there on time. Yeah. So it's, it's much more individualized in that way. Um, which just, again, makes this all very complicated and convoluted. And, and like, does Jahan really need more reps on any of these plays, yeah. any more reps on these routes, or does he know it? And yeah. that's a, a question, obviously, the staff has a better answer for, and that's kind of the kinds of things that they're thinking about. But I don't know. I just feel like it's been a bigger discussion this year than it has in years past here. And I think part of that is because the enemy comes sure. from kind of the Andy Reid philosophy where Andy has He's played play. guys versus, you know, you mentioned McVay earlier and the Rams where yeah. they don't really play anybody at all. Yeah. And I, and I think again, it's just about, it's a, I think if you're thinking longitudinally, if you're preparing for every contingency with, with, with regards to this season, at some point, Jacoby's going to be playing football for you. And I don't think you want to be in a situation. And that's not, I'm not saying, like, I'm not saying Sam's going to be playing bad. I'm just saying, like, you know, injuries, whatever. Yeah. Busted chin strap. He loses his helmet on the side. Like, whatever it is. Jack literally used that. Is that a football thing? Is, the busted yeah. chin strap? Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, Jack used that earlier they today in the, the press drill. conference. Like, so, like, when you're doing um, substitution drill on usually Saturday in the walkthrough before the Sunday game, they, they'll they be like, all right, hey, um, you know, Logan, I'm the backup gun. I'm the backup l5 on kickoff coverage right so the starter will be like oh bust the chin strap and he'll run off the field like he's going to get his chin strap fixed and then i'll have to come in you know so they don't want to say anybody's hurt anybody's anybody's down it's just like a nice way to be like working substitution drills. yeah got it okay yeah. continue with yeah. your, your much more important thought than explaining <laughs> the analogy uh, that it's a, a known football term yeah yeah so um i kind of heard what we were talking about because like that was such a good uh like, jacoby he's gonna play football this oh, year yeah, he's, gonna, he's gonna play football for you at some point this year for whatever reason it is right. and so definitely a busted chin strap yeah definitely busted chin strap and i look at the kansas city chiefs last year and how mahomes got hurt in the playoff game and then you know uh, chad henney is that the yeah henney. chad henney comes yeah. in and plays and plays well and that's not by accident like there's preparation that goes into developing that. And I think this is kind of the foundational piece of that development is you're, you're always trying to prep for, I don't say every scenario, but as many scenarios as you possibly can. And I think this is one that's very easy to prep. I know you're exposing potentially some guys that are going to play football for you this year to injury in the preseason game. But I also think if I'm, if I'm going back to kind of an old school mentality as a coach, like, you know, I think coaching at the high schools helped me kind of see this is I want to see it real time living color with Jacoby, with the receiver in a live situation because, you know, cadence is different. Motions are different. I, I want to see it. And so like, if I'm being truly absolute in that like coach's perspective, I think, yeah, I'm okay with them playing this game. I think the thing I would say is like as a player and as a talent evaluator, as a, maybe as a head coach, I would probably approach it differently because I don't want, I want Jahan to be ready for week one. I want you know, Cornelius Lucas to be ready for week one or whoever it is, right? I want them to be ready for week one. So this isn't as important to me. But also, that being said, they, they do have a buy now. They a kind of a buy before season, right? Yeah, that think, schedule is so funky. I hate it. It is, but but maybe I think that probably is part of the calculus here too. It's like, hey, if something does happen, like Terry got hurt in the in the uh, second preseason game, he's got three weeks now to get ready. And I and I think you feel pretty good about Terry being ready in three weeks, you know, like even if it's a different kind of work schedule. So 
I would say that I would say like as a, as an offensive coordinator, I'd probably treat it differently as a head coach. I'd probably treat it differently as a GM or, you know, whatever I'd treat differently. But I think there's value to these reps. And I think people fans, because of the tradition of the preseason about how the fourth game doesn't matter, everyone's getting ready for regular season, forget that every single rep you have is an opportunity to make the team better. And I forget that too. You know, I forget that, you know, as an analyst now, but it is like every rep, has value so yeah so the question then becomes for like specific to this game this week like yes it's good to prep jacoby with the ones right like that is a smart um that's a smart thing to have ready for the regular season but is doing it in practice enough or do you need those reps in the game because the other thing that's happening like literally today it was funny the, the interview that people hear at the end of the show with Jahan. i yeah. say hey man you're done with with training camp how's it feel right yeah. like they're done with training camp yeah. and so you're now going to get into the mode where you're preparing for arizona and you might even do because you have such a long time you might do a little look ahead to some of the other teams sure. and then really that that game week in your regular rhythm you know you get in on monday uh and then ultimately practice on wednesday of that first week leading into arizona you're obviously 100 percent on arizona mm -hmm. but like at that point sam's getting all the reps um because you are preparing right. for that game in a regular season mode so this is your last chance to do it in practice is that enough or do you need to do this in the, the preseason as well to really feel good about it and again i'm going to say this is annoying but it depends right it depends on your perspective and if i just from what I've observed of VB, it's not enough. I want to see more. For Ron, maybe old school Ron, last year Ron, obviously it was enough, right? It's not as important. So I think all of those, it, it just is a matter of perspective and where you're looking at it. And I will say, as an offensive coordinator, you're so much more competitively tied to that offense. And you want to make sure everyone's ready to go. So it makes sense to me that EB wants this, right? And, he, and knowing him as a, like, you know, he was at my coach in college, where I got to see, he wasn't my personal coach, but obviously he was around and I, knowing his mentality, like this makes perfect sense. This is totally in line with his philosophy. And I think there's value here. And a lot of people are, maybe don't see it because of how the preseason has been treated in recent history. But, you know, again, like it, there is value to these reps. And I do think <clears throat> if I want to know what Jacoby looks like with these guys, there's no better evaluation point. There's no better point of study for me than having him play right now in the preseason. So, so do you think we'll see Hal at all? I, I, I mean, I guess Ron already said no. Yeah, Ron said no. But so I'd say this: if Hal had looked, if there was any doubt, any doubt at all about Hal's performance, like I'm saying, like he has the same stat line, but he throws an interception. Yeah, or he has a bad two minute drive. I think he might play. I think his his performance was so comprehensive in the second game that you're like we don't really need to see anything more. But if there had been any kind of hiccup, any kind of issue, I think he probably would have played. And then Jacoby would have played two quarters. And then Fromm would have played the last quarter. It would have been almost, I think, exactly the same as it would have been in the second game. You know, very, very similar composition. Maybe just a little bit less for Howell. A little less Howell, a little more Jacoby. Yeah, yeah. and then, then Fromm, right? So, but I, I think, um, but I think he, he was so awesome. You know, I think we, you know, we talked about that on our, uh, our last podcast. Like, he, he, there was not one thing that I came out of there saying, besides the blitz recognition that I was like, he needs to do better. And right. you, how much blitz stuff are you going to get in the fourth, in the third preseason game? Probably. Right. Not. Probably not. Um, it is something I know uh, Dan Orlovsky was talking about this today of uh, that Sam, you know, the one weakness that he's shown in the preseason is blitz recognition yeah. to pick up. And obviously that's going to yep. get a lot better as his file of what he's seen in the NFL gets a lot better. Um, and I'm sure that EB and, and all them are working on that. Um, so, all right. Know how, Yes, we'll see Brissett. You, I how think, much? I mean, I mean, based on what we saw at practice today, you know, like yeah. it feels that way. But yeah, and I, I think that feels right. You know, I, I being him, it's. It, I think it's weird for me because he is so, such an established player to think that he would play in this game. But I think Brissett for sure. And then I, I don't know. Like I was the, gonna say, dot. Like it seems like yeah, the one hundred line is gonna. It play. seems that way. Yeah, like maybe I mean, minus Leno. It, and it seems that way. And I, again, like that fits with the offensive coordinator's perspective. So. That I think that would be a little bit unusual, and a lot of people kind of raise eyebrows. But um, I don't think EB cares. What do you think? Yeah. I think he cares what he thinks and what he needs to see. And so, um, don't be. I, I, what I would say is like I, we don't know for sure. We're kind of speculating, but right. I would say don't be surprised if if that group's out there. The, the whole the whole ones. Don't be surprised. Yeah, I. If there's one group that I pull quicker than the rest, it's or one guy specifically, it's Dotson. <laughs> yeah, but Dots Dotson and Samuel. I would pull like if you want to get them two series with Jacoby, fine. I think get those dudes out of there. Like yeah. it's just you made it, you made it this far. 
you have less time if something does go like right, forget right. forget if they you know something really bad happens like obviously that that can happen at any point but like but there is a time take a long time to get back from you know so yeah be careful there you go that's exactly right <laughs> Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. That's Logan Paulson. I'm Craig Hoffman here at the studio slash kitchen of Logan Paulson. All right. Uh, cut down day is Tuesday. So we will have a chance, obviously, on the pod to kind of project R53. I've been doing it on the radio show too. Mm-hmm. Um, but as, as we think about that task and how Ron is going to approach it with EB, with Jack, with Nate Catcher, the special teams coach, yeah. it becomes really important in these discussions as well there's some very interesting uh discussions amongst us in the media on the sideline today about numbers and about yeah, yeah. this versatility that versatility like what what do you think are the most intriguing spots that they're going to have to consider and some things that that they're going to have to try to figure out from practice squad to yeah. you know make sure they got enough positional depth to special teams to make sure they don't cut a good football player that could help them yeah, I think that's really tough because, uh, you know, I think one of the things that the second preseason game showed me, and I think you too, is that this team is a little bit deeper than it, it feels deeper than it's been the past probably couple of years I've been covering the team, which is a good thing, right? The problem is you got to cut good football players. So in terms of like interesting points, um, I would say the offensive line is really interesting to me, um, you know, just because I think that because of how Ricky's been playing at guard, it gives you some flexibility. Now I talked to one of my old old line coach buddies about this kind of hypothesis after we talked on the field today. And he was like, Oh dude, you always keep 10. Like no doubt. So, you know, there is this kind of pervasive thought that you would always keep 10 guys, no matter what. And so if that's the, if there is that kind of underlying tone throughout the NFL, I'm sure that that people on the staff have heard something similar. So I would just say like, even though I think you get away with keeping nine, like I think there's a very traditional school of thought saying, let's keep 10. So if you're keeping 10, I think maybe a guy like Larson makes the cut there and then you're you're kind of so let's, at other let's spots. go just quickly. We can yeah, name yeah. the well, we actually did that on take five. So yeah, people people kn- five. people know the eight uh, that are definitely on right nine. If you nine, count Braden Daniels, nine. Um, then to me, the 10th spot, if you if you're going to keep 10 and I think I would keep nine because of other stuff that we'll talk about in a second. But, but I'm just saying there's if, like, it was, it was my, but my buddy talked to me, it was just sure. like 10 and it was like, no, there was no compromise on it. So just heads up on that for sure. Yeah. But you then have a question of, do you keep Tyler Larson as a third center who's had a really good camp? Like there's yeah. no Tyler Larson has done nothing Correct. that warrants being cut yeah. outside of not being other dudes. Yes. <laughs> but yes. Trent Scott has yeah. had a really good camp at, at, at right tackle yeah. and they're are you just going with one backup tackle with the contingency plan of like, if things go haywire in a game, we'll put Sam Cosme out there and then, you know, call up Trent Scott, hopefully off our practice squad for the next week and sick kick Sam back inside. Like these are the questions that they've got to ask. I think I'd probably go Scott, but I don't know. Larson's a good football player and he's a veteran and he's been around and yada, yada, yada. I'm super biased on this because like I value tackle more than I value interior offensive line play. And again, that's just my personal preference. I know there are people that feel the other way about it. Center is super important. Like I got in a long conversation with someone that follows me on Instagram about how center is the most important position on the O line because they touch the ball every play. I don't disagree with that. I just think it's harder to find good tackles. So if I find a serviceable tackle, I want around. So I would probably go Scott here too. Like we've talked about that a lot off camera. Um, but I also understand that this staff has this proclivity for keeping centers. They want centers. They've been burned by center injury over the last couple of years. Right. So they, I, I would assume if I was trying to be in the head of the staff that Tyler Larson's the guy. And like you said, Tyler Larson's had an excellent training camp. Like there's very few mistakes that I can think of in practice or game that he has made that, that I would say you that, Oh, that's why he should get released. Like he's been very, very consistent he's been very competitive. So he's a good football player, you know? And like, if you want him on the roster, I get it. But just from a personal preference standpoint, I want, I want another tackle. I just think they're more valuable. Right. And I think one of the things I would say is that that maybe limits Scott here is that he, he only plays tackle. He has not worked in at guard. Like if he had been repping at guard at some point and tackle, you'd say maybe they can make that work or maybe there's some flexibility. The fact that he's only played right tackle makes me think that he's kind of pigeonholed in that one spot and in today's NFL and this is not a thing that you know like obviously Ron has talked a lot about position flexibility this is something league-wide that is taking over the offensive line position if you're not starting one of those spots 
we need you to play multiple spots. So like corn plays left and right tackle. Right. Right. Scott has only played right tackle so far. So he hasn't shown the flexibility, which makes me think, I don't know how they feel about him. Like Larson, I know they like him, you know, like just what's not to like basically. And so I would say that if I, if I'm, if I'm putting my head in the minds of the coach, I would say they'd probably go Larson. I know if I'm doing it, I'd probably go Scott, but you know, that's kind of why these decisions are so tough because there is a, a very strong perspective on some of this stuff. Yeah. And, th- th- but also like, that's why Trent Scott could probably get through a practice squad. Sure. Like how coveted is he going to be? Right. Um, and by the way, they signed him uh, after he spent last year on Pittsburgh's practice squad. Right. So like, he's a guy that's been available to any other team and nobody's went and got him. Um, yeah, he's had a good preseason yeah. and some of that was with the ones on Monday night football when everyone's talking sure. about Sam Howell. So like maybe his stock is higher, but, um, yeah, man, like it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough. tough. And I think it's um, also I, like culturally, like, what do you want to, yeah. what do you want to be, you know, like, do you want to be, um, like this kind of down gritty, like kind of, we got centers and turn it's it just, it's a, it's a, pers- and I will say like Larson's a, a good pro, you know, I don't know Scott that well, but like Larson, I've talked to him a couple of times, like he's dialed in, he's professional, like yeah. having guys like that around is always good. So yeah. there's other things besides play here that are important, like his personal relationships with the coaches, like his professionalism, which is very, very high. So and practice squad eligibility. Yeah, yeah. Like That's Scott can yeah. get on and, and Larson, I'm guessing probably can't cause he's 32 know, years the, old the and he's rule, been around. The rules now They've are so changed weird, yeah. so much. Yeah. So I don't know what the rules are. Um, but you know, I don't know, man, it's weird. I, to me, I'd still, I know I, I realize that traditionally you always keep 10, but traditionally you haven't had a 16 person practice squad that you can yeah. call dudes up from as easily as you can. Now I, I don't even so. understand the full rules. Cause sometimes yeah. it just feels like the same guys get called up every week yeah, and you're yeah. like, like how that's been it, called up more than twice. Yeah. yeah. How does that work? And then he just goes back to the practice squad on Monday. Like, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. Um, so I, for that reason, I think that gets us to the other line yeah. of like, okay, defensive line, they're on overload. Yeah. And if I've got a, like, you're telling me I can either keep Tyler Larson or Trent Scott or James Smith Williams, Casey Tuhill or KJ Henry. Like I'm keeping all three of those D yeah. linemen. And yeah. I, that, that to me is like not even that difficult. Yeah. I can't, I kind of can't believe that like James Casey, their spots are being even bantied about in some yeah. circles. But also like if you look at the numbers, like it does get a little scary. And Andre Jones has had a really good training camp. I think that's yeah. the other thing. Like that, Andre, that's the guy that kind of quote unquote messed it up. Yeah, like kind of mess or is you know making waves, I would yeah. say, right? He's like he's just had a really good training camp. Yeah. And, and I know they like him a lot. He's explosive, he's long, like all those things we've talked about with him. And I think, um, you know, that, that kind of disrupts the status quo a little bit. And so now you say, well, he's got to be on the team because like of how they like him, how they view him. But it's like, you know, Casey's had a good preseason. James has had a good preseason. Do you bump one of those guys for a develop, a, a quote unquote, a developmental prospect? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the right solution is there. And it's just, it, these are the things that why I think it's really hard to be in the coach's shoes in these moments, because you like the guys, you like the players, you like the person, you like the way they work. They haven't done anything wrong. Right. But it's more about philosophically, like where you want to go. Like both those guys aren't going to be under contract next year. Do you want two young guys on the roster who can develop and maybe become versions of those two players with maybe more upside? I don't know. And I'm, it's all speculation. I'm not saying Casey and James are bad players, but there's, there's a business element here and a future element here that needs to be considered when constructing a roster that I think is easy for, us to overlook but the people making the decisions they're not thinking about 2023 they're thinking about 2024 from a financial standpoint and i think um like james and casey both have been good football players and they will need more money to be here next year but if you're going to re-sign montez if you're going to re-sign chase there there's not more money to be had so you need some cheaper um you know maybe less experienced options yeah well see that's the thing about those two specifically right my chase, my trust level in Chase to be healthy the entire year is not, not very, super high. but not FA, very high. But FA's had a great camp. That's another one that's like, been a little bit disruptive in terms of the roster because, like, he was a guy last year that I felt like you couldn't trust him completely, and now all of a sudden there seems to be like FA is definitively the third guy, you know. So maybe you feel like FA and Andre Jones, you know, that combination works really, really well. So uh, to your point, like, do I trust Chase to be healthy the whole year? Probably not, but I think he's going to play. And I think they kept 10 last year when Chase was kind of in that in-between up and down mode also. So, Yeah. So, man, it's just so tough. Because, but, like, to that point, right, like, I want F.A. and James and Casey's options over Jones and Henry, even though, like, we're excited about those dudes. But, like, if they got to play now, I want the guys who have been there. 
yeah. and who helped me be a top 10 defense for a lot of last year yeah, yeah. in there. So I, I don't know. It, it just becomes really tough. And then the other thing too is inside, like if John's got plantar fasciitis, like I'm scared that could flare up and yeah. cost him a week at some point. And then, but then I think do you go with a guy like Benny. Well, like, that's what I was going to say is yeah. like Benny Patoy has had a really good Solid camp in preseason. Yeah. Do you, and he's the three technique, yeah. like, you know, cause and that, and that gets in like a big Phil Ridgeway question yeah. because those dudes are probably better suited as one text or, yeah. you know, no tackles guys, in, yeah. in the Cinco package. Right. Do you, I mean, Ridgeway was so good for you last year. Big Phil's hurt, yeah. but he's a second round pick. Yeah. So like you're not moving on from big Phil already. Yeah. I don't know, man. Like that uh, defensive line room's a mess. I think just in, keep, a, in the best way. Yeah. I think keep an eye on like that eight week IR. I think that's going to be a big tool here for, for one of those guys, you know, or like season IR for another young guy. It's a way to kind of save roster spots. Oh, you've got like a weird calf strain. Oh, it didn't bother you yesterday. But oh, it so sorry to hear, <laughs> you know, you come in, you have a meeting with coach and it's like, Hey, thanks for coming in early today. So sorry to hear about your hamstring injury. You're like what? What hamstring injury? <laughs> yeah, it's like, your hamstring yeah, injury. Make sure you get treatment on that. And I'll see you later. Yeah. And then you're on the IR for the year. And I've seen that happen before. You know, B Mitch has talked about that a whole bunch of times. He had a whole bunch of stories about that. Smoot will tell you a million stories about that. It's, it's a, it's kind of a sneaky way around it. So I would say with that group specifically receivers too. keep an eye on somebody who's like, who wasn't hurt. Well, all of a sudden is hurt. Picked up an injury into the game. <laughs> yes, right. But, uh, you know, if this calf injury with Big Phil, like that could be that, a short term. Like, like, a, like an eight-week IR type thing. If you, yeah. If, you know, and especially with Benny playing well and, and Ridgeway playing well. And then you kind of keep everybody around and then demote uh, Benny to practice squad when, when Big right. Phil comes back. So Right. That could definitely be an option. And, you know, also sometimes, you know, obviously guys get hurt in the middle of the year. So, yeah. like, you know, something happens to another guy and Big Phil comes back. You know, like, thank God we got him. And then the other guy goes on IR with a legitimate injury. And, like, that's how you, you tend to do those things. I just have a hard time thinking that, like, you know – I know Kyle said on his pod, like James Smith Williams and like James is my guy. Yeah. Um, so well, he's I, my guy too. Like, yeah. Like, you know, I, like and, James, yeah. yeah. Like, and you've worked with him, you've worked with Casey. So like, this is, this is hard, but like, this is the league everyone. Yeah. And I think that's like a very human thing that everyone should remember. Like when we're speculating recklessly about 53 man <laughs> yes. roster spots, like these are human beings yeah. with families and responsibilities yeah. and bills to pay. And, and this is their job and their livelihood. And while yes, like if James or Casey were to get cut a hundred percent, they're signing somewhere else. Like now they got to move. It's yeah, a week before the season. Deal. Like, yeah. I mean, have you, you had that. I've, that's yeah? happened to me twice. Yeah. Uh, when I was here, I got cut in, what year is that? 15, 15, 15 yeah. I got cut. And then like, which less, is why our paths never crossed until yes. this podcast. And then uh, less than 48 hours later, I was in Chicago playing there and my wife was pregnant and like I had a two year old and you know, like she was like seven months. It was crazy, man. And so like, that was just a tough deal. You know, I had to live in a hotel out there. Like we couldn't get a doctor for, it was just, and so it is hard. And then the same thing happened when I was in Houston. Like my, my family was getting ready to move down there for the season and I got cut signed in Houston. I lived in a hotel for nine weeks and then got cut again and came, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough. And it, you know, like I'm not saying don't cry for me or cry for anybody. You're getting paid good money to do it, but it's not sure. like the most, it's like not like this ideal, like Aaron Rodgers like marches in the, the Jets facility and kissing <laughs> babies and stuff. It's like, oh, here's your bag of stuff. Like, go get in your locker, and then we'll cut yeah. you in a couple of weeks. Learn so. the playbook. Yeah, it's uh, different different vibes for sure. sure. Don't even bother finding a favorite restaurant. Yeah. Um, but anyway, to finish the sentence, like, I have a hard time thinking those two dudes that have contributed that much to this football team and are key special teams guys. Like, I just – I feel like I have a hard time seeing them get cut. So do I, but I've, I mean, we've both seen crazier things happen. Yeah. You know, like, and I, and I wouldn't, and I think the thing that gets me about this whole situation is Andre Jones seems to be in a very good spot. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He seems to be in a very good spot and I think they're very high on him. Um, and he's and his, and his ceiling is maybe a little bit higher than those guys. And I think that's what you're probably betting on is that, Hey man, he's not better today, but week four or five of the season after getting some reps, like, He's there. And right. again, he's the disruptive element in this whole group. Because I don't think, I think, you know, I think KJ Henry's had a fine camp, but I don't think it's been anybody you're like, oh God, we, we need him on the roster right this second. So he's not been quite as disruptive, but, um, you know, he's a fifth round draft pick. So that's another element to that too, is you've, you've invested draft capital in that position. So you got to keep him around. I, I Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. I know on, so when you do the, you know, the injury bit, right. You have to keep that guy initially, which means you're gonna have to be light somewhere else initially. Yeah. I wonder if corner is a spot where they are light initially. Corner is a nightmare right now. Um, so corner, you obviously have, uh, 
BSJ, Fuller, uh, you have Emmanuel Forbes. Right. I think Danny Johnson's a 100% lock. It seems that way. Um, cause he can play inside, outside. He's, he's a key, well. key special teamer. Um, he's played really well. He's had a good camp. I don't know if there's anybody else that you're like a hundred percent. I think so Holmes. Say it one more time. So, so uh, the, the, the top three, the top right? three Danny plus Johnson, Danny. And, and then, then Holmes and then would be the guy. Holmes would be my next guy for sure. And I think he's, I feel, I, and again, talk about, you mentioned cats earlier, like a guy, like he's, he's your starting gunner. Right. And the, if you're a starting gunner, so like Percy Butler's the other one, he's not getting cut. And the other guy is Christian Holmes. Like he's in, there's five. Yeah. And so if that's the case, there's five. I think then you go Quan and then Forrest and cause, Butler. Because uh, Quan Curl. can also play nickel if you end up pitch right. if you need to. Yeah. So that's we would say five corners, and then I guess that's five safety. So I guess you're you're ten, 10. there. Yeah. But I do wonder if like Holmes is a guy that, you know, does is that special teams enough to keep yeah. him when you if you keep like a Byron Pringle and some other guys that have yeah, played I mean, gunner in the past. I mean, I think so. I think I think I think when you got a guy in your corner like the special teams coach, like he gets my been this has been my experience and it's probably changed a little bit now because of the devaluation of special teams but they get three dudes that they will like stand on the table for mm-hmm. and i it just feels like given and especially given his first the, the performance against cleveland I, I just feel like he's as close to a lock as you're going to get you know yeah. what i mean and um i think if you're light anywhere it's probably a linebacker i think you're only keeping four you know you you think that i mean they were like Khalid had a loud start to camp um you think they only keep three i'm just you start to do the math and the thing is I will say this. When Anthony and I did the exercise on the radio, yeah. we were like, who to keep? Actually, the last spot, I was like, I don't know. I don't care. Yeah. Um, and I was able to keep, I, although I do think I had Ridgeway off. Let's, let's, say, let's just do that real quick. So you'd keep 11 D linemen, right? Yeah, if you keep you 11, keep, then I think you I... You keep 10 corners, and then you keep four linebackers. Yeah, but then you got to keep nine on the O-line. And that's where well, it gets let's, funky. That's 25, right? That's 25. Then you can keep 25 on offense. Frantically be, pulls up roster oh projection. Oh, my gosh, yeah. But then you keep uh, you keep 25 on offense, let's just say hypothetically. So you go nine offensive linemen. You go seven receivers. You go f- three running backs, four tight ends, two quarterbacks. And you're at 25. Okay. Math math on this podcast is tough. Yeah. But so, that's what, so to me, in this example, do you want to keep um, one less – tight end potentially and then or one so, less receiver and keep 10 alignment would be the question well so that's yeah so I, i've got it at mclaren dotson samuel brown uh oh no that's the wrong one there you uh go. mclaren dotson week, samuel right? so brown <laughs> pringle allen so it's it's six receivers three running backs three tight ends plus fullback so wherever you want to slide yeah, arm I, I put them as I, put, I said four tight ends but. yeah um and then i think i just went with the no, I think we wound up adding 10. Yeah, 10 alignment. You probably have 10 alignment. And then, do we keep? And we did. How did I get all these dudes on the roster? <laughs> I don't know, man. This is what happens when I do math. The point is, it's, just, they got some, it's actually like a like a 56-man roster. No, it's, I, well, I scrolled down. I was like, am I got one extra column? Nope, that's the 54th column. And there's a name position one at the top. So that is 53 names to get yeah. there. So, so it's. That's what I'm saying. Like when you do it, I think you're the, the, the one O line. Nine or ten. The more I think about it, the more I talk to you around the league. I think they're probably going to keep ten. Um, I think you can keep eleven defensive linemen. You can keep uh, ten defensive backs. If you keep four linebackers, you're golden, right? And then if you keep ten offensive linemen, it's like, do you keep? Uh, I think do you keep Alex Armour? Or do you keep an extra receiver? That's where it gets a little bit. When I think Alex Armour, right? I now think Armour's on the team. Deserves to be on the team. 100, I totally agree with you. So th- to me, it's like Casimir Allen, Dax Milne. Um, who else is it? Pringle, I think, is on. I don't yeah. think there's any question. Maybe I think Kemp, Kemp maybe. is a guy that could mess around and, and make it. And Bryson Tremaine's ever had a really good couple he weeks, has, but, but I, I think just, he was too far back. I don't th- and I for whatever reason I don't get the sense that like everyone's like Bryson Tremaine, you know, like everyone's like, Yeah, ah, you know, like he I think he I he is a Logan, I say this every once in a while, he's a Logan Pulse type of player. Like in they were doing like a walkthrough today and he's like sprinting his routes, and I'm like, Yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> he's out there early. I'm like, Yeah, do that. You know what I mean? He's like finishing and playing hard, and I like that. And I think there is a spot for a guy like that, and hopefully, he's like your practice squad guy. Hopefully, yeah. but um, I, I right now I think that in terms of value, if you're keeping six, it's Pringle. I would probably even go Dax right now over Kaz, unless Kaz has a great third preseason game. I'd probably go Dax just, and then Kaz is on practice squad. 
with Bryson Tremaine or Tinsley or whoever you want to keep there, maybe even Kemp. Yeah. And then you say, those are our six, and we can bump, elevate whoever we need to elevate over the course of the deal. So. Well, guess what? We're going we're gonna to watch this game. You're going to watch from the sidelines uh, yeah, we'll with Jake and B. Mitch on, yeah. on NBC4. Uh, I'm going to watch it from my couch. That's uh, nice. Yeah. And then, and then on a, a Monday, we're going to sit down. You're going to sit down somewhere else in this house. Yeah. I'm going to sit down in my own <laughs> home. And uh, we're going we're gonna to do a projection. So Dude, that's going to be, we're going to do the exercise. I'm going to have to do it twice. Cause I'm going to have to do my own on the radio. And I'm going to do this on your, on the radio. There's also, there's always a chance. There's always <laughs> a chance. So, uh, that's, that's coming up. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, that's it. That's the end of the podcast. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, up next, you'll hear my interview with Jahan Dotson and we'll see you next week here on take the Man. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't you why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart. <laughs>